Greetings, and welcome to Swamp University. Today's video, we're going to talk about soul contracts. And we're going to cover what they could be, as well as what I think they are, um, and what are some of the gnosises that are out there. So, let's get started. To begin with, in the most layman and simplest terms, the idea of a soul contract ties probably primarily to the idea that most humans have, psychologically, that we have to have purpose. We have to have a reason to exist. Okay? Um, this helps us fundamentally with our psyche, with our existence, and with our endurance to persevere in, during hard times and struggles. So, first we have to understand or come to an agreement as to what a soul is. So Christian dogma uses the term soul to represent the spiritual embodiment or the spiritual element that, that gives life to our bodies. But if we look at the ten parts of self, there isn't something that represents the Christian dogmatic soul. For us, for pagans and for non-Christian path people, we may not even consider that we have a soul. We have breath or spirit that gives life to our body. That's the spark that creates the rhythmic existence of us. We have thought and wisdom. We have spiritual connections to our ancestors, to the land, and to the primal energies that exist around us. And we have metaphysical power. But we don't really have what we would constitute as a soul. So, for this video, and for this video alone, I want to use soul and spirit as the same thing. Because we're talking about soul contracts. If we're going to talk about soul contracts, I'm going to define the soul as one's individual spirit. Okay? And then contract is a agreement, an obligated agreement between multiple things. Okay? So in the simplest form, your soul made specific agreements to come here, in theory. Who knows what those agreements are? If we knew what those agreements were, how would we, how would our reality unravel? How would we deal with chaos and free will? So we can't really know what our soul contracts are. But we can see in a way that they probably exist. I 
I don't think soul contracts only exist between the soul coming to this reality and taking a form and our reality. I think soul contracts might exist and be written and created as the ebb and flow of life. As we make choices, those choices put in action things we can't undo. That would be a soul contract. An example would be if we slowed time down and jumped off the Empire Stakes building. Our actions built a contract we've jumped off the Empire State Building. Now, at the current reality, of, speed of reality, um, it wouldn't take long for the, the um, effect of that contract to take fold, to unfold, right? But if we slowed it down, then we can begin to see how this is, this is really an agreement we've come to. If we jump off the Empire State's Building, Inevitably, we are going to plummet to our death and wind up splattered on the street below. And there's nothing we can technically do to stop it. We've already jumped. It's already in motion. It's going to happen. To me, that's what a soul contract is. We've agreed to have something happen in our future, and we've taken the action for it to happen. It can be devastating, i.e. being splattered on the sidewalk at the face of the Empire State's building. Um, maybe they can be beautiful. Choosing to give birth to a child and watching your nurturing and protective behavior create an environment that that child thrives in can be beautiful. So if we break it down in that way, soul contracts are really the agreements we make with our spiritual self and reality, or between our spiritual self and reality, to have certain things happen to us. Now, they can be challenges. Um, I'd imagine our enlightened self might say, I want to endure starvation. I want to experience that hardship. And so we would pick a, a life that we'd be born into that already has a future played out that it's going to experience starvation. Maybe not to the point of death because free will again, right? Plays, gets in the way, right? But you're going to encounter that time, that period of time of starvation or that period of time of, of loneliness, or that period of time of self-dread and loathing. You signed up for it. You put it in action. It's yours. And because of free will, you can stay there, or you can decide to end it. In most cases, not all. Remember, it's a contract. And we don't know what we said in the creation of said contract. If it's jump off the Empire State Building to our death, then there's nothing that can prevent that from happening. We will fulfill that contract.
That's the important part. So how do we make life what we want it to be? By living within magic. If we begin to visualize our future based off of our actions, thoughts, and ideas today, we have to be all in. We have to commit to the new contracts, regardless of what old contracts come along. We can't ignore the old contracts. We have to accept them too. But we're on this new path. So we'll tend to and we'll mitigate those old contracts based off the contract. There's no way around that. But we have to choose not to let those repercussions ruin our future that we're now in charge of. Okay. Um, I guess one example of this would be um, Christian turned pagan. Uh, Christians are baptized so that, and then they believe in this idea that when I when they die they'll be judged for their sins and deemed either worthy to enter heaven or not. And then there's all kinds of indoctrination associated with that. So I'm really being very vague here, um, simply because I don't want to talk about Christianity, but it's a good, it's a really, I think I have a good analogy for um, changing a contract, right? So for the first 20 years of your life, you were devout to this idea of being saved and being purified, and when you die, being judged. And then in your early 20s, you decide to become pagan. Or anything else that's out there. Egyptian, African traditional religion, Celtic, a plain witch, whatever it is. But you firmly denounce the idea of being saved by Jesus, and you denounce the ideas of heaven and hell, and you denounce the ideas of being judged by St. Peter when you die so that you can go into heaven. You denounce these things. You walk away from them. Mind you, it doesn't have to be formal. You just have to walk away from them. Well... You live the rest of your life, never looking back, never worrying about Christian judgment and that dogma. And then you die. There's a chance that because of your oblig obligation to this Christian faith. That one of the first journeys your spirit takes is to the gates of heaven. <laughs> Where there's a dude standing there named St. Peter. And he's probably very stoic. And he probably is very bored because if He's if there's a dude doing that and that's all he does he's probably in purgatory and hates it um, <laughs> but he's serving God and let's face it saints like to serve God um, or at least we think so the Christians think so maybe um, so there's this dude and he, he looks at you and he says hello name please he already knows your name, but he's being cordial and polite and, and talking, of course. And he goes to your sheet and he, he says, So, are you ready to be judged? 
If it was me, my answer would be no. I actually don't want to go in there. I had an obligation to come here and meet you. You can pass judgment on me, but I'm going to use free will and I'm going to walk the other way because there's other things I want to do with my existence. Okay? But if I was a Christian for a period of time in my life and eventually um, was baptized and believed that any point in my life I would be judged by St. Peter so I would have the ability to go into heaven, that would be a soul contract that I would have to attend to when I die. I can't get out of it. The good news is that particular soul contract doesn't say I have to go to heaven. It says I'm allowed, if I'm found worthy, I'm allowed to go to heaven. And hell is the absence of God. So, me choosing to go the other way, well, you take it for what it is. I'm not going to nitpick. I'm going to go over here because my ancestors had a different idea and it made more sense to me. Always. So, we can do that. Possibly. Um, perhaps it's not an Empire State Building fall. Then again, maybe it is. We don't know yet, because we're still alive. And even being someone who can cross over to the world of the dead, um, I don't see any proof of those options not being there. Okay? So, if we can change the contract or work within the boundaries of the contract in that scenario, odds are we can work in the boundaries of a contract in many other scenarios. And this is where it becomes important. If we find that every step we take, we're suffering the same fate. A businessman whose business fails every six months. He's got great ideas, he's got financial support and backing, and then miraculously, somehow, every six months, whatever business venture he's on, fails. We could probably find in his Orlog a sole contract for him to fail a business. Or more importantly, for him to fix something before he can have a business. Right? That would make more sense. Perhaps a debt that his family has that he has to repay. Perhaps uh, some test or challenge that he has to endure. Okay? So we can go looking for these things to see if there's something attached to them that requires his attention before his business can be successful. And that would have been a sole contract that he has to, he has an obligation to fulfill. But as you start your journey forward from here, don't get hung up on the idea that you don't have free will that these contracts are immutable and unchangeable. Because if that was the case, then none of us would have free will. And none of those contracts would take into account the, the primal force of chaos, which by all rights rules over us more than any deity or ancestor could possibly the primal force of chaos is the undoing of everything and makes it possible for everything and anything to occur in our reality. So, 
if we apply chaos and the laws of chaos to our soul contracts, then none of our soul contracts technically exist. Because falling off the Empire State's building, even though the fall would take microseconds, some chaotic event could get in the way. Some unseen intervention could stop it. Or he could be that fool who instead of dying becomes a paraplegic and lives. That's chaos. That's the primal force of chaos. We can assume if we jump off the Empire State Building you're going to fall to your death. And as soon as we make that assumption we become asses. Because chaos says whatever we think will happen only has a probable chance of happening. We cannot predict the future. We can create probability. We can predict probability. But nothing set in stone. Not even the past. And that's some screwed up shit. So you mean to tell me that what I did yesterday isn't set in stone? I can undo what I did yesterday? I can change it. If I can change it, then any contract created from it can also be changed. If I jump off the Empire State's building with a parachute, I won't plummet to my death. I've changed the contract. If I can get the parachute to open. And that's what chaos creates. That's why every tribal tradition has a being that represents chaos. Sometimes they're referred to as a trickster. Um, sometimes they're uh, an anti-god or the primal force that the gods war against. But there's always something representing the opposing force of order. And generally, the gods and the servants of gods tend to try to keep order for mankind and put things in an order that, in a way that, that is orderly and makes sense, right? So their nemesis, no matter what it's called, no matter how it's described, is the primal force of chaos. Um, or is the trickster against the gods who are going to do things just to get in the way of that order. That's chaos. So be aware of the contracts you write. Stop and think. What am I going to do today that I won't be able to just undo tomorrow? And if we can figure those out, then we might find a way to only write good contracts. And good subjective. So it's good for us. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. And a special thanks to the patron who asked me to talk about Soul Contract. Um, if there's questions or subjects that you would like us to discuss here at Swamp University on our Patreon page or in any of our communities where we're active, Feel free to reach out to us. Give us your ideas. 
we've been teaching at Swamp University for oh, a little over five years, and we've covered a lot. Um, and perhaps to us, we, we might feel like we've covered everything, but you haven't been with us for five years. Anyways, most of you haven't. And so you might have missed us covering something. So feel free to ask. Feel free to reach out. We'll either provide you with where we did cover it, or we'll create a new one. Um, and because of new learning and constant growth and change, it would probably behoove us to do new videos. Um, so ask. Bring forth your questions and your ideas for topics so that we can dive deeper into our, our own individual spirituality and in turn help each of you dive deeper into yours. If you have any questions or comments pertaining to soul contracts, please ask them below. I'll answer them, we'll have a discussion, or we'll just talk about it. Thank you again. We appreciate every single one of you. If you're not a member of our social media and our Patreon group, please reach out to us and ask us how you can join. We appreciate your support. Have a good day.